And without further notice, I would like to introduce our first speaker of today, um, Michael, or Mike, as, <laughs> uh, as uh, we call him. Um, and Mike is a graduate student at the University of Washington here in Seattle, uh, whose research focuses on end user programming for authoring interactive robot behaviors. So today we're gonna to hear Mike talk about exactly this. And the, the title of the paper is Interactive Repair of Social Robot Programs from Implicit User Feedback via Bayesian Inference. So I'm just gonna hand the stage to Mike. Hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Mike again. Um, I want to start with a little bit of the background story of how I got into robotics and why it's sort of relevant to what I do uh, today now. And then uh, since Patricia mentioned that it could be a bit informal, I'm going to keep it a little bit informal. It's not going to look very much like a real talk. Um, and uh, yeah, so please excuse already. Um, so I started uh, when I was undergrad or when I was in high school, I wasn't, um, can you see a picture of this dude? Okay, good. So when I was in high school and when I was in college, I was into uh, rock and roll. Uh, and uh, when I was young and dumb, I used to play around, um, around the venues and uh, hanging out with people and play uh, guitar. Um, and when I got into college, uh, I found this uh, sort of a digital uh, processing or digital music. Um, I'm not gonna try to play in here, but uh, when I was trying to, when we were experimenting a little bit earlier, um, we found that there were some sound problem. But I, I found the computer as really interesting artistic medium because it really allows you to uh, change the uh, sound quality as, as 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 weird as you like and you could really make uh, things interesting sound so i got into this uh, digital processing and then i also got into more uh, visual mediums um it was the earlier days of the uh um computer processing stuff uh for me it, it the, I, I think techniques has been there for a long time um so what I found really interesting was that uh, computers allowed you to do the multimodal presentation uh, really easily. And um, then, then I, I found this uh, uh, machine listening or machine um, seeing uh, at that time. Uh, I think now it's called the computer vision. And, and I found, oh my God, then maybe we can even do a back and forth, more like an improvisation or jazz jam type of, uh, or rock and roll jazz jam uh, kind of work. And then uh, I emailed a couple of professors in the department and someone said, oh, HCI or robotics may be your fit. Uh, so I sort of got into uh, robotics and, and that's how I started into, uh, started, started my journey into grad school. But my interest always has been this uh, multimodal interaction and then uh, user interaction or user experience with this comput computational agent that can uh, be uh, work with you to uh, create new experience or new sort of uh, behavior or even just uh, it could be just work. Now to the, the actual talk. Uh, that's sort of my background on how I got into uh, robotics or, uh, oh, can you see the screen? Black, right? Okay, what's going on? You have time to go get your coffee if you want. <laughs> it might be also a, a connection problem or something like that. Usually when you use Google Drive um, for slides. But it's really oh, good. I see. I see something now. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So today I'm going to uh, talk about our uh, recent work, Iterator Repair of Social Robot Program from Implicit Feedback. And this project started from our, or roboticist's painful experience of uh, 
how hard it was to, to create the natural and uh, robust interactions for social robots. Uh, we were working on, I was working on various projects that involved um, interactive programs and it always required tedious and error prone tuning of the interactive program parameters such as a timing or a perceptual threshold and that had to be done per each robot user who sometimes changed their behavior over time and it really demanded um, to repeat the whole parameter tuning process again and made me very painful. Um, so because of this parameter tuning problem, most widely used end user programming tool usually provide a text editor that to let the uh, users to modify actual code of the program, which is not ideal. So our goal of the research was to facilitate fluent and autonomous social robot behavior authoring with an expressive yet maintainable approach, ideally by non-technical users. I just want to give one more example with this exa uh, example that gave us an inspiration. In this video, uh, the robot was supposed to approach to this person and initiating uh, interaction and the robot actually got into the interactive zone. However, it failed to uh, initiate the interaction because threshold for starting the interaction wasn't attuned properly and the person sort of ignored the robot, it didn't really understand what it was doing and then moved on. Uh, something that was interesting was from uh, the observer of the situation could easily tell, oh, well, it should have started and it, it, it wasn't in the right uh, state. So you, it, I could have told the robot, hey, you should have moved on. Um, there was one way to fix this uh, broken interaction or the other way was the user could, if the user really wanted to uh, engage with the robot or if he prepared the interface right, user could have initiate the uh, interaction by themselves because it knew that robot was trying to do something and then uh, the person was there to fix the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, initiate the interaction. So based on this uh, observation, we proposed this following uh, iterative process for either incrementally repairing the uh, programming par uh, program parameters using feedback provided by the observer or robots user on the fly. It starts with a programmer writing a transition function for um, robot behavior represented as a finite state machine. And we introduced a domain specific language for creating the uh, such tr state transition uh, function, which you see underneath. And when the programmers are in doubt, we allow the DSL to use the uh, poles, which is sort of the uh, uh, probability distribution or which allows the uh, programmers to ex express the unknown parameters as a range of the value instead of the concrete value. And this allows um, the uh, program to sample the value and uh, start the uh, program regardless of the, uh, uh, the actual parameter uh, provided by user. So in this, when system runs, um, system collects the traces like FSM inputs, outputs, and states occurred during the interaction. And because the sample values for holes are often not tuned correctly, it likes, uh, it, 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 the system will likely to make some mistakes and robot uh, people usually get frustrated. Um, for, for now, the ro uh, robot should, shouldn't, should have waited for the person to uh, finish speaking, but then it moved on, so the person got very frustrated. We observed that there are two different types of uh, uh, transition errors that can occur in scenarios like this. First is the incorrect, what we call the incorrect transition error, which is the robot t taking initiative, uh, moving on to the uh, next state uh, mistake mistakenly. So in the previous example, robot thought the, uh, the person finished the interaction by looking back at the robot and then robots triggered the next thing. Um, so that was the mistake. And uh, this kind of error could be provided by, uh, uh, prevented by providing some uh, interface like uh, go, uh, manual uh, interface that allows user to manually uh, fix the, uh, uh, manually change the transition. For example, a go back button here that uh, the person could tap. Another kind of um, 
transition error we have seen is the uh, missing transition error, which is the uh, robot not responding to person when the person is done uh, with uh, their action. Um, in that case, so on a, again, this similarly, the uh, uh, one could provide the interface solution like uh, next button to force the, uh, the robot to move on to the next uh, transition, uh, next state when uh, the user observed this type of error. And we, we assumed a recovery mechanism like uh, providing interfaces like O2 or next buttons in this um, example is, is, all, is possible in most cases. Once the interaction is over, the program can spot the uh, breakdowns uh, by checking the robot's user input and correct the mismatches between uh, the expected and recorded state trace to produce what we call the uh, correct state trace. And as I mentioned brief, uh, just again, uh, just before, such corrections can be uh, come from the uh, user's recovery input instead of the, uh, the, per the third, third person monitoring the system. And uh, by in this way, the uh, system frees the uh, programmer from remaining in the, the loop for fixing the uh, interaction after the initial program creation. Uh, ideally, um, uh, maintain, automatically maintainable by continuously interacting with the uh, robot's user. Um, either way, the repair algorithm uses the uh, corrected state uh, provided by the programmer or the uh, robot's user to estimate the whole di distribution um, and the process is iterative, so it, as the more and more, more data comes in, it improves the uh, 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 whole parameter or try to estimate the better whole parameter. Or if the, uh, the user's paradigm shifts, then it will try to uh, track to the, uh, the better parameter over time, track the uh, uh, better parameter over time. Um, this is just the former, formal uh, pseudocode for our, um, our algorithm. It starts with the uh, program sketch K and a uh, set of distribution over whole variable data. Um, and for each iteration, it runs the program with the current whole values uh, or sample um, whole value and record traces of FSM input I and state O. And the uh, corrected state trace comes somehow uh, either from a uh, user or the programmer. And uh, when the user is provide uh, when user provide the feedback, we used another algorithm called the implicit state correction, which is essentially just deriving the corrections from the recorded um, traces. And uh, uh, but uh, and the core part of the uh, uh, core step is finding a better set of holes or uh, re-estimating the whole distribution or updating the uh, posterior by taking the uh, map estimation of uh, posterior distribution over the holes. The, uh, this distribution is computed using the uh, overlap between corrected state tr uh, trace and the uh, candidate state trace as a, as a likelihood. So essentially what it is trying to do is, is trying to minimize the uh, gap between uh, the, what the previous before repair hole could, uh, uh, the state traces that generated by the using the before repair uh, parameter and then it will look at the uh, the uh, the corrected state trace and then it'll try to uh, tune the parameter so that the 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 uh, the, the updated FSM could produ uh, produce the, the the latest or the uh, the corrected uh, state trace. I I don't think I'm making too much sense, but please uh, ask me, ask me questions uh, during the uh, Q and A type time. And um, again, the final step is the uh, um, updating the prior with the posterior so that the iteration can keep going. Um, the three core benefits of our approaches are, first, it allows the uh, programmer to use the uh, distribution instead of uh, using a concrete value. And when we use the uh, inputs coming from recovery inputs coming from users. Uh, it frees the uh, programmer from having to be in the loop um, uh, by the uh, collecting the uh, data from the uh, the robots user. And finally, our uh, Bayesian approach makes the makes the algorithm uh, more efficient in online setting than um, than uh, more traditional algorithms for uh, repairing the program. Uh, which, which naturally fits the, uh, the, our target use cases, which is the uh, uh, 
interacting with the users uh, on a long uh, run. Uh, we ev evaluate the uh, second and third uh, part of the, our claims in our evaluation. And to do that, we first systematic, uh, to, we wanted to systematically evaluate the uh, proposed uh, Bayesian recur algorithm. So we created a human simulators for sampling a large number of the uh, uh, potential human behavior as an FSM input um, and um, ground uh, truth state uh, traces to uh, use it for, um, use it as an input that's coming from the, uh, the programmer or the, uh, the robots user. We, as a, um, we created more traditional search-based recur algorithm at, to use it as a baseline method. And we compared the two algorithm over three robust social interaction scenarios over five repair iterations. And we measure the uh, interaction quality of each algorithm using the percentage overlap between the ground truth and the repair uh, program state trace as a, as a me measure of some sort of uh, interaction quality. Um, and we also measure the uh, um, algorithm speed using the uh, repair time uh, to kind of measure the quality of the, uh, the algorithm. Our results show that our proposed uh, algorithm performs nearly identical in the percentage overlap or the interaction quality measure in all three scenarios. And it outperforms and outperform significantly outperforms the uh, baseline as the uh, our proposed Bayesian repair time remains at constant, which is the blue, uh, while the uh, the baseline more traditional uh, search type repair time increases linearly over the iter iteration. To test the uh, full pipeline, we conducted the human experiment with ten participants and a custom built social robot you see in the picture. Um, the participant interacted with the robot over four iterations, each participant, and we measured the uh, interaction quality using objective measures such as the uh, number of the uh, uh, interaction breakdowns or the feedbacks provided by the user um, and the uh, total, total interaction duration in seconds, uh, often because it, it, the shorter duration often means a uh, more fluent um, interaction. We also asked three subjective questionnaire uh, designed to measure the uh, fluency between human uh, robot interaction designed by Hoffman uh, in 2019, or I think actually the paper was presented in 2013. Um, and our objective measure results show that the uh, number of breakdowns and the total iteration dura duration generally decreases over the iteration. So in other words, the user provided less corrective input and the generally the interaction, uh, the total duration was becoming shorter because there was less mistake and going, uh, going back and forth. And the, uh, the ratings for subjective um, uh, measure questions uh, increased over time. Basically they said that it, it felt more fluent uh, over time. I just wanna show one example from our qualitative results. Um, this video shows one participant participating in Q&A interaction scenario. Um, when the participant stopped speaking, the robot failed to detect her floor gaze, uh, floor management gaze inversion, and moved on to the next question. And it, it bro broke the uh, interaction and and uh, made her very frustrated. And by floor management gaze, um, uh, uh, sorry, F floor management gaze in, uh, aversion, I meant uh, our humans, this behavior of sort of looking at somewhere else when they want to sort of uh, want to continue speaking, but just kind of holding the, uh, the conversation for a bit um, and then come back to uh, come back to looking at the person uh, when, when they want to continue speaking. That's what I meant by uh, floor uh, management gaze aversion. And I, we implemented that, uh, um, that behavior uh, as an FSM involving the uh, speech input and then the, the gaze input. Um, and initial programs parameters for detecting the uh, gaze threshold or timing for the uh, speaking uh, speech was wrong. So uh, after the two rounds of the repair, this is what it looked like. Um, here, the person is looking at somewhere else for uh, sort of 
cooling the floor a bit and then speaking. The person is looking away and then uh, speaking in and out and the system was able to track the state pretty well uh, towards the end. Um, we, we have more results and uh, um, discussions in the, in, in the paper and I can, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit more about that and uh, clarify confusions um, probably made during the presentation now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so just moving on to maybe a discussion part or a Q&A. So I know you are all muted. So let me just give you the, the rules that we thought could work, but we are still testing these rules. So let's see. Um, so every time you want to make a question, you can just let us know by raising your hand on or just dropping your question on chat. I think everyone can see the chat and then we will unmute you. Um, and so um, also another thing I didn't mention in the very beginning is that uh, you are being recorded. So just to let you know that we will have to uh, kind of have your consent, but uh, we will, we will uh, share this on YouTube later if that's okay for you. But just uh, let Mike know of any questions you had about his work, if you want, or I can just start myself. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Miguel. <laughs> First, I don't know, but I, I didn't see a raise hand button on the on the participants. Oh. Maybe I'm, I'm technologically okay. deficient, which is probable. Um, do you see, see like a button called forward. yes? Yeah. yeah. In the Maybe we can use yes. Yes, I think yes is a good option. Uh, first of all, Mike, thank you so much for the presentation and, and for the, the paper. I really enjoyed reading. Sometimes people just say this, but I actually did. Um, and um, I don't have any particular questions because I think you were very clear. I just have some discussion points that I would like to address. Um, the first one um, is about the scalability of your method. And I can give you a, a concrete example. So here, for example, here at GARPS, we worked with a, an autonomous robot for therapy with children with autism. Uh, and it had a, an FSM and it had a, actually quite big FSM. So it had sub uh, state machines for each activity. Uh, so it's, it's quite a complex uh, machinery. It's, it has dozens of parameters. My question would be, how do you think your method would scale? Because if we have dozens of parameters to estimate, which we don't, we don't know, uh, I mean, the number of interactions required to estimate those parameters would increase as well, right? So do yeah. you have any idea of tackling more complex scenarios in the future? Oh, definitely. Um, uh, more late, latest machine learning techniques and latest uh, uh, um, uh, Bayesian inference may, may work. Uh, that's usually the, the first line I say, but uh, I think I, I, I acknowledge that that is an issue, scalability in an, an issue. And right now, or even in future, at least in short term, a short term future, I think um, using this sort of approach requires a bit of a careful design of uh, FSM. So um, FSM allows you to uh, factorize some of the parameter smartly in, uh, in a, a transition function. So, so my, my approach scales right now, if you use the exha exhaustive um, search uh, for, uh, for the inference part, then it, um, it uh, increases exponentially in, in number of a transition. Uh, not the number of a state, which would be way worse. Uh, it it uh, increases exponentially in the uh, combinations of the uh, uh, parameters within the transition. Um, you know, you can really try to, one, the developer could really try to make the uh, uh, parameters as independently as possible, but that actually makes it less interesting because the complex, the interaction of those uh, parameter is the uh, time that we would like some help from the computational system. Uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, in short term, I would like to uh, try to try to encourage the uh, developers to kind of be a bit more aware of uh, uh, how this uh, um, when things blows up, uh, when when the system blows up, and, event and eventually uh, 
I, I do think that some of the uh, machine learning techniques might actually catch up in, in some Bayesian inference literature, then the more and more advanced, uh, advanced we method we have, uh, we try to um, uh, take, uh, make use of them. That's, I think, in, in the longer term, uh, that would be the plan. Um, and and I, I had this conversation many times, and uh, then then I get the the next question, you know, oh, how can you enforce like that? That's not reasonable. Like, how can you enforce the developers to do this? Um, I, I unfortunately I I think that's the kind of only way. I I've been working with the uh, program synthesis people who uses the um, um, hardcore like Z3 or this uh, traditional search based. Uh, um, 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 helpers for you know repairing or synthesizing the system for different kind of scenarios but the main idea is that uh, the programmer leaves some part of the program as a blank and then and then it try to ask the uh, system to kind of uh, fix the uh, or, or uh, make the program work it, it, even in the latest greatest tools developed in that literature which is the uh, the leading I think the community that that invent these techniques um, they still support a bunch of, uh, uh, they, I think the direction they are going is they are coming up with the various tools, debugging tools for helping the programmer to better understand, um, a better work with the uh, solvers in some sense. And I, I think that's actually kind of interesting. That, that again, like that goes back to my, the very, very motivation, the very first, uh, like my earlier high school ex college experience, working with the computational system, like how can you, uh, make it work with the computational system. And uh, I think that's the right way to go. I mean, like working, making the uh, develop, uh, asking a bit more from developer, I mean, uh, what, what I mean by a right way. Uh, I think it's reasonable to ask the developer or people who's involved in this to uh, uh, be a bit more, uh, put a bit more effort instead of asking the computer to do everything, uh, which is just like gigantic exhaustive search. search. Um, that's, that's my take on that question. Thank you, Mike. Kim wants to ask a question, so let's. Um... Ah, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Michael. I thought this was a really cool research direction. I've been starting to think myself about this problem that we all face as you know, social roboticists that we always have to do so much work to be able to get robots to do things that don't look simplistic or you know, socially wrong in the sense that they violate some social conventions or um, not expressive. There's like so many problems that arise when um, a technical programmer tries to kind of you know, come up with these uh, parameters and fine-tune them and the timing there's there's so many variables that can have a, a very big difference in terms of the interaction um, my question so first of all I would like to give you a comment and then I have a question to ask you the comment concerns um, so when I when I heard your uh, your presentation uh, I thought about uh, the idea of using things like that uh, of course, to you mentioned this idea of you know repairing right the the interaction in the sense that there's usually a convention, there's <clears throat> some rules about how people interact uh, that are violated and then they're repaired. I think that's great. I think the other part that's really interesting to me is having worked with the so-called persistent robots, robots that are consistently um, deployed over long periods of time. Uh, at CMU, we have the cobot robots. They're navigating in indoor environments. They're visiting different offices. And people have very different reactions to these robots. People want to interact in different ways with these robots. They have different preferences. They have different attitudes. And so I think this is a great opportunity for running your programs in a personalized, personalized fashion. If you are able to keep track of who you're interacting with, uh, the robot could you know, have different versions of the algorithms of the algorithm running for different people. And I think this is a great opportunity for, for personalized interactions. Uh, so this was my comment. Uh, my question is um, how ideally, if you had access to very powerful algorithms that could involve you know, very complex interactions and learning, how do you see the ideal scenario where 
um, you have a designer kind of you know programming these behaviors but there is of course the uncertainty that you talk about and then you have a diverse population of users that interact with these robots right with different preferences with different ways of interacting um, so what would be the ideal scenario would you want to have a dialogue with a robot and tell the robot hey uh, next time can you do this differently or would you want the robot to pick that up by itself um, so kind of in a utopian world how, how do you see this uh, ideal kind of paradigm for programming social behaviors on robots um, thanks for asking the uh, question Kim I and and nice to meet you I actually read your paper uh, LED I, I look, noticed your last name oh, cool. I was like hmm, is that the is that the right guy uh, and yeah, I that's just the, uh, <laughs> the, the LED expressive light when I was in Sabiok um, I was playing with the LED light quite a bit and then um, you know I was like hey, is anybody in academia looking into this uh, this this thing and then I found your your work and um, uh, and about your comment, um, I, I'll get to the question soon, but uh, about comment um, from the, some of my field ethnographic work, work I've done at Savioc uh, for making the robot uh, to collect the customer survey data, uh, oh, customer satisfaction data from the uh, hotel guests. Uh, one of the requirement from, or, or desirable features from the uh, hotel personnel was uh, personalized interaction. Uh, because they know that's how they teach their staff members to do this uh, because they know there are business traveler travelers and then family travelers who have very different requirements for the interacting with the uh, staff members so they're keenly aware of that and then they uh, train staff to do that so I think that's the sort of the right way to go and uh, the one one problem there is you know uh, obviously the privacy issue and you know the the more and more data you have from the and and even there I think there are some solutions to that uh, from more security perspective uh, but I, I won't go more into there um, so, so just no, to comment no. on that the the trick that we use at CMU is that people are in offices so if you visit a location you're assuming that the same person is at a location so you don't need to keep track of people's spatial yeah. features, for example. Got it, yeah. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, uh, um, the ideal interaction, I always think of the uh, Westworld or the uh, knowledge navigator as my uh, uh, vision. Um, or, and, and more concretely for this particular um, scenario, I, I, I do think that, I, I think that the, the program, the, their, the human, the, the system designer person always had to be has to be in the loop. I don't think there could be a completely autonomous system that can always track the right parameter over time, uh, at least in near near short term, uh, uh, near short term as in next five years. And I would like the uh, the system maintainer person or the programmer person to sort of be monitor how the uh, distribution over parameters uh, the holes are changing over time and there are studies about how humans non-technical humans are interpreting probability distributions and you know chi's and you, you, you know there's a lot of work on that topic so i think i mean that's really exciting uh place uh, research topic to look into i actually proposed this idea to a couple of uh, people in in the uh, department as well because uh, that's sort of a uh, now take the humans are now taking the uh, sort of the or the programmer is taking more of a maintainer's role or the sort of the monitor's role instead of uh, the uh, the programmer's role and we in in my lab I think we always talk about those two uh, uh, phases separately initial program and then sort of the maintenance um, and I think the more and more um, most of times people are spending time here not 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 in the initial uh, paradigm. So uh, uh, looking into these uh, 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 interfaces or paradigms for uh, uh, showing the distributions or kind of helping them better understand because distributions are actually harder to understand than concrete value, right? Because you, it's just a range of value and you have to kind of like picture how it will look like that. And you, even, even, even if you wrote the program, the combination of all this, the, the, the numbers to actual outcome is actually pretty hard to uh, form in, in the head. So um, taking the maintainer's role is difficult. So I think that the more research can be done there. But addressing your original question, I think that's um, some sort of an ideal way of uh, doing that, uh, doing this sort of uh, monitoring person uh, interface, I think is, is the, uh, um, the direction I would like to see. So either <clears throat> 
collaboration with the designer and programmer, they create the first set of the program somehow. And then the most likely the designer person or the uh, customer service person, non-technical person sort of looking at the, uh, the behavior uh, of the robot or sort of maintaining what's going on using the sort of a high level um, um, interface or parameter, uh, uh, sorry, the parameter is not the best way, but some sort of a high level interface to kind of uh, monitor the parameters that governs the, uh, the agent's behavior. That's, I, I, I'm pretty excited about that direction. And the reason why I mentioned the Westworld in the beginning is because that's sort of how the, uh, not, not the Anthony Hopkins guy, but the other guys are looking at the tablet and looking at uh, adjusting the parameters or like drives or whatever. Um, so I think that's, and, and you know, whenever something's going wrong or the regular maintenance checks sort of thing. So I, I think that's a pretty reasonable sort of uh, architecture um, or the, the workflow to shoot for. Obviously, this may change in within two or five years I, as, as I keep looking into this topic, but currently that's what I'm thinking. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Someone else has a question? Let's see if I can unmute you. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see. All right, thank you, Michael, for the great talk. Yeah, I enjoyed also reading the paper. Um, uh, yeah, very interesting. I was wondering, um, because in, I think in the cases that you showed, um, the feedback is kind of, um, for example, in, in the speech segment that you showed, where the robot started talking while the person was looking away, thinking that they could take the, the floor. Um, basically, the person would say, go back, and they would go back in the conversation and do that part over, right? Did I understand correctly? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so basically you would do that until the robot did not interrupt uh, you in the conversation, right? Until it yeah. got it right, the timing. Um, so it seems like you can just go back, go back and iterate over that until you get this right. Um, and I can't imagine like in social interaction, you probably have a lot of uh, scenarios or situations where it might not be this certain, so, so clear kind of like, okay, there's one feedback I can give until you get it right. We repeat and repeat, repeat, but it might be a bit more, uh, I don't know, more, has more dimension, I guess. So you would need some more, um, uh, more high dimensional feedback or some more um, sophisticated feedback than just a, a button uh, from a person. Um, how do you, do you envision that you can use this kind of similar approach um, in more complicated, um, scenarios or more like uh, when the feedback is not just a button of go back or reset or something like that where you might um, need to learn something that is more um, um, yeah uh, maybe yeah maybe you understand the question yeah uh, um, I, I love that question as well and uh, some of the uh, reviewers pointed that out as well um, I we well two two ways to handle or two thoughts on that topic First is uh, we were um, initially this project started as identifying the uh, interaction breakdown patterns and uh, ways to fix the uh, inter uh, uh, ways to fix them. Uh, we started from there and then uh, we had this uh, sort of a two by two or two by three uh, chart to identify when are the times that this sort of paradigm could work. Um, um, and, and the dimensions evolve, involve the proximity to the user. If user's not in front of the robot, I don't know, maybe they can have the, some wearable and then just say it or something like that. But um, I, there's always a way to kind of get around, but there are times that this kind of paradigm seems very um, concrete, uh, very natural versus, versus not. Um, so I, I still hope to have some time to actually flush out that uh, the, the paradigm to kind of like, show that hey you know these are uh, the times that you can use this te uh, technique and then it's actually quite it covers quite wide range of the uh, the task that's the uh, first that uh, first thing uh, um, i wanted to say and the second thing is that uh, I, yeah I, I agree i mean it just doesn't cover everything and in some other uh, times you just have you just need the different kind of ways to uh, get the feedback. The important thing is that uh, you need some sort of a corrective signal some, somewhere, uh, whether from the, uh, the, uh, 
programmer or the person, the, the robots user in the middle of the uh, interaction, or the more common approach I see is the, uh, at the very end, right? Like the vo voice agent type, uh, you do this uh, interaction and then the agent asks, oh, how, how satisfied were you? And then you say uh, yes, no uh, type thing. And then uh, with many, many uh, data, such uh, the, the information just propagate through the, uh, the, the earlier part of the inter interaction. And in those, those guys, uh, I'm thinking about like dialogue uh, management community or the chatbot community and uh, they're not even like FSM, right? So like all these uh, parameters are like very, very complex and, and weird. Uh, uh, not weird, but the, 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 uh, something that it's very hard to sort of visualize. Um, so, um, so I think for whatever that makes sense, uh, I think one should use. And uh, again, I, I like, uh, the reason why I sort of went to this approach was I like working with tool that I understand. And again, like, because I'm sort of a human computational agent uh, interaction guy, I'm interested in seeing like, how can we make the system more understandable and uh, um, uh, by both computational agent and human and kind of like collaboratively working with them. That's why I sort of like the, so even with the uh, potential uh, 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 loss from like not being able to support this very complex interaction or very uh, easy feedback, um, I, I I, I've been looking into the uh, the techniques that I, I looked into because of that reason. Uh, I, I I don't think not I haven't seen too many um, work in 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 that uh, uh, direction where more structured program and then kind of working with uh, both computational agent and the human. I, that's that was the motivation for looking at that problem. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe if there's time, I have a follow up question. But I don't know if there's time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great answer. I think. I mean. Um, maybe then would you recommend if you have, you know, because sometimes you might not know what the feedback exactly might look like, or, you know, you can also imagine that you might keep giving the feedback, but it takes a bit more time to actually learn the correct behavior. Right. Um, and I've read some papers and maybe it might have also been in yours um, that the, the most common thing that people say is like, I would, I wish I could have uh, maybe done something earlier that I correct the behavior myself. Um, and I, rem it was, I was reminded when you gave your talk, um, because they can give feedback, do you also envision that maybe people can somehow give more corrective uh, behavior or like corrections to the robot in a more direct sense? Or you would say like, no, maybe we stick to feedback for the non-expert users um, and keep the corrections to more like the experts or programmers. That, uh, what is your perspective on that? That would be interesting to hear. Um. Um, uh, would you, would you, sorry, it got disconnected yes. a little bit. Would you, would you repeat the last part uh, one more yes. time? Sorry, I can't. Um, so basically in short, the question would be if you would uh, suggest that um, non-experts could also be giving more direct corrections or would you recommend them to stay basically to giving feedback and leave the corrections of verbal behavior to the experts? Um, got it. Okay. Um, um, high level. That's because uh, even at high level, um, especially for the non-expert, uh, one of the problem I discussed in the discussion session is that uh, incorrect feedback. That is a severe problem. Uh, sometimes um, it happens because one, they just don't care. Um, they just like give whatever the feedback don't care or they get too comfortable. Um, towards the end, they just think that it will just work and then they just change their behavior do the uh, the exercise much faster than the, and then it's just like it, it's not tuned for that and then it just gets wrong it, it breaks and then they don't give the uh, feedback because oh it just made one mistake I, I know it works and and they just like so so incorrect or this uh, unintended uh, uh, feedback was problem and um, again for that reason I think that in in truly deployable system I think one needs to have the operator in, in the in the middle to kind of see what has happened. Um, there may be more uh, intelligent or computational solution to that. I, I can't I couldn't think of my head uh, for now. And going back to your original question, the direct feedback versus the uh, uh, high level. The reason why I said high level was because because of that in, incorrect problem. Um, if you allow the uh, end user to give uh, uh, more direct uh, feedback as people, uh, I think only one thing I'm thinking of is Anka Dragon's uh, work, like actually changing the uh, the uh, the manipulator's uh, trajectory while it's moving. Um, 
I think the, the more and more incorrect feedback person give, although uh, so, so in, in that scenario, uh, for that particular scenario, it makes sense because the task is very concrete uh, and there's a very clear sort of a uh, um, feedback there, there may be like a 1.1 1 .1 solution point and then everyone's just giving feedback towards that solution space. But if the solution space is really large or if the task doesn't have very clear, um, correct uh, output, then people may give like really bad signal. Uh, and then the, the, the amount of the, the volume of the uh, feedback is, is large, you know, the trajectory or this whole thing, then that can, that can um, um, push the, uh, the, the solution to the wrong space even harder than, than, um, than the high level. Uh, that's my gut sense, I don't know. I haven't worked with uh, uh, more direct signals uh, lately. So uh, that's my gut sense, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, thank you so much. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I want to be mindful to everyone's time um, and we will be closing very soon. And maybe I can just drop one question um, that is not so much related with uh, your talk, Mike, but I just remember that it's related with your stage in life right now. Um, if I am able to ask. So Mike defended the PhD very recently and he's currently looking for jobs. And I just wanted to ask you, given the audience we have here, um, postdocs, PhDs, but maybe future faculty, future academics, I don't know, if you have any insight or anything you would like to share with us on something you've learned, something, I don't know, that you recommend doing to others, but you didn't do yourself. And maybe we can close with this answer. Oh, that's too much pressure. Um, I am definitely not. A, uh, I, I I wasn't very successful in my grad school, so I don't think I I'm not I'm not uh, I, I don't think I I can uh, get, give very uh, useful answer. But uh, but um, I, I guess the, I guess persistent again. Like I wasn't very successful in grad school. Um, uh, and, you know, I saw uh, being in UW and being surrounded by these amazing people, you know, I started the, uh, the PhD with Dieter Fox, uh, who's like, have amazing track record. Um, Maya Chakmak, again, amazing track record. And like the people who flocks, in, flocks them, they are all like super amazing. And like, you just keep like hating yourself. Oh my God, why is it like, why is this doesn't happen? Um, and, and I think like it, took me a while for me to just uh, uh, realize that, hey, you know, my strengths is different, my interest is different, uh, my direction is different. Um, you just gotta, like, you just follow your, like, be true to yourself and just keep follow your own interest and try to develop uh, uh, research out of what you are interested in. Um, and I think it took me a really long time to learn that because, like, I was trying to do more ML stuff, um, more, uh, yeah, but I don't think I was pure ML guy. That was sort of the, my big thing, like, oh, why can't I like do the ML thing? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the only uh, one big lesson that I can I think of right now. So basically kind of discovering what your field is takes a while and then uh, when you do that, there is some time lost, so. Yeah. And also, and, yeah. yeah. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Now, I was just wondering if, if you also felt that there were too many stimuli around you with amazing things happening and you had to close doors and focus on your work at some point. I, I think so. Um, yeah. And uh, just try to embrace, embrace yourself and then just like realizing life is really long and sometimes luck might happen later, I think was, was a big, you know. Uh, you know, I, I mean, okay, life is maybe not that long, but you know, uh, just just not try to hurry too much uh, at, at the current moment. I think was 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 big, and I just made like too many mistakes and too many like bad decisions. Oh my God, I want to do it. I want to be like and just like hating yourself and all that stuff. Uh, uh, just yeah, I think if I 
could tell earlier myself, you know, just, just be true to yourself and something might come. But in reality, that's not even true. <laughs> Let's real talk. So, so it's just that like, I didn't have, uh, at that time, like it was just theater. There was no Maya. Now that I'm thinking about it, like there was no Maya. So I think Maya arriving uh, there and then me being able to go sub yoga, I think that was the two big breakthrough. Uh, I, it was just like, I was, it was just lucky. I guess lucky is, I just got lucky, you know, like Maya just got in. Uh, so I switched in the middle and uh, I was able to go Savia where I was able to see the real thing, uh, the, the, where I could get the real inspiration. So, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was my take. I think that's a great insight. Um, so any more questions to Mike, you can direct to his email. Ah, Lakshmi, uh, would you like to uh, ask something? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, if, it can, if it's possible to answer in the short time that's left. Uh, so, I mean, so I see that there are some pers in-person studies that have, that have been conducted for this paper. Uh, do, what would be different if it had been done now, like during this situation where we have like everything remote? Uh, how would it change in terms of that? How would you deal with it if it's fair? The user study? Yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, how can we do the uh, similar type of user study if in, in this remote condition? Is that, yeah, I yeah. that correctly? Yeah. Um, I, I actually originally planned to do this study uh, remotely. Uh, to I wanted to do the crowdsource study uh, like, and then show like 100 of uh, human participants. That was my ambition. Uh, I kept telling Maya that I can do it. Maya told me, hey, keep it simple. Uh, I ended up listening to Maya, otherwise I would not have finished this, uh, the study. But what I was trying to say is that I, I do, I think that's fine as long as your, um, uh, your participants, so, so the biggest challenge for doing the remote study was you cannot control the participant setting. I mean, you all know your HRI people um, or UX people, like you just can't control them. And um, I think there are a couple uh, super smart young guys in our lab who's collecting like sound data or vision data from crowdsourcing study. I think even that's like super ambitious because you have to so somehow like assume or control that they, their, in, uh, uh, their input quality. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge, like somehow controlling or screening the uh, participant with the right condition um, and kind of controlling them to stay in that right condition during the, uh, the study while you're not being in there. Um, again, I think uh, I can definitely point to some of the guys in our lab who's doing that, I, who, who I think is just amazing and ambitious to be just trying something like that. And uh, Patricia may have a lot of experience that, with that too, working with the, uh, um, uh, doing remote uh, um, user studies and participatory studies lately, uh, just, just some insights on how to control um, um, user study type, uh, uh, user studies in, in remote setting. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer myself, but definitely uh, Patricia or other people uh, might have more insights. But, but my main thing is uh, the control, somehow like really thinking about how to control the uh, input or output quality and then the user sort of a behavior somehow during the uh, study that just like having a really good plan and, and then just battle testing that through like your friends and coworkers. But that's, your friends and coworkers are biased and then in the wild, you know, like people use PC with like webcam like from 10 years ago, like, I don't know, 240, pixel you know like you know like you just have to somehow fight with that somehow yeah. or have, have a solution somehow thank, thank you if you do and, please uh, yeah if you do please uh, share talks I would love on, to. Uh, yeah we will also have more uh, talks on um user studies and maybe we can bring some that actually have more remote settings so that we understand especially in the time of a pandemic how people are thinking about this. So that's actually a very interesting topic for, for future uh, talking robotics. And I myself would like to learn more because I feel like we don't have rules for it right now, especially online remote. So this might be a very interesting topic to bring next. Um, and I think with this we can close. Miguel and Silvio, do you have any other aspect that I'm not covering?
Okay, so let's just thank Mike one more time uh, by thank clapping you. virtually. Thank or, you. Yeah. Thanks so much for uh, inviting. Um, it was it was my pleasure. Thank you for accepting the challenge. Uh, it was really really good, and I wish a good day or a good evening for everyone. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.